We will now move to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. I guess Nish Bogimich, could you question you again about infrastructure? And I call Mr. Harry Harvey to ask the first question. Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I'll be question one, Minister, please. I call the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I was pleased to be able to commit funding towards the first tranche of part time 20 miles per hour speed limits at 103 schools across Northern Ireland. These measures will increase driver awareness aimed at reducing vehicle speeds outside and near these schools to provide a safer environment for parents, children and staff as they go to and from school on a daily basis. Six schools within the Ards and North Down Borough Council area were included within the first tranche of part-time 20 miles per hour speed limits at schools programmes which is currently being rolled out and due for completion in June. Given the restricted budgets for works of this nature, as well as the practicalities of delivery, it was necessary to limit the number of schools in the current programme to around 100. Unfortunately, based on the assessment scores, Grey Abbey Primary School was not ranked as highly as the other schools that were included. However, I do intend to take forward a further tranche of part-time 20 miles per hour speed limits at schools and can assure the member that Grey Abbey Primary School will be considered for inclusion in this programme. Programmes across all council areas are currently being developed, and I am not therefore in a position at this time to identify what schools in the North Down area might be included. Can I just ask for clarity? Is the Minister taking question one with question four as we were pre notified? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was advised that question number four was withdrawn by the business office. Right, well, no, the members are here, so. Um, okay. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to um, offer that answer uh, as a group answer with your uh, agreement, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Please do, yes, thank you. Is that okay? That answer I'll offer as the, the composite answer for both questions, but happy to take the supplementaries. Just there will be a supplementary given to, to the member, okay? Um, so I call Harry Harvey for a supplementary. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, what is the total cost to your department to implement these 20 miles per hour limits at schools, considering that the cost of safety cannot be easily measured? Thank you. I thank the member um, for his question. Um, the budget that I allocated for the rollout of the first tranche was £2 million. Um, while I have yet to make final decisions in terms of the allocation of this year's budget, I am very much committed to the rollout uh, of this scheme because I believe that many more schools should be included in the 20 miles per hour programme. So certainly that is my intention, and I hope to be in a position to be finalising uh, budgetary details um, in the very near future. I call Alex Easton first up for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I think the Minister knows what I'm going to ask. <laughs> Minister, can you explain to me why not one school in the North Down constituency has been included in the first tranche? And can you give me a guarantee that um, Malaya Primary School and Crawford Spring Primary School will be considered for the next tranche? As I have to say, I feel it's very unfair that North Down have missed out. I thank the member for his question, and he has made a number of representations on this issue, so I realise the importance of it to him. Uh, To be fair and objective, the department operated from an assessment framework that is long established, and while it was not possible to extend it to further schools in the member's constituency, uh, I am committed to rolling this out further, and all of the schools, as I have indicated in correspondence with the member, will be considered uh, for inclusion in that programme. And As soon as I am in a position to be able to confirm the details, I will ensure that the member is made fully aware. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for answers uh, to date. As it happens, I was speaking to the Chair of the Board of Grey Abbey Primary School this morning, who has left me in no doubt about the deep, deep anger within the community uh, about the failure to provide the 20 mile an hour zone. Uh, the community will note that the Minister to date has committed to nothing further than uh, assessing Grey Abbey for tranche two. Uh, could I put it to the Minister that if a process is being seen to take precedence over protecting the children that we are here to look after, that that anger will not be dissipated. I thank the member for his question, and I have received a, a number of correspondence from the principal and the chair of the Board of Governors and other elected representatives in respect of the school. So I certainly 
understand uh, the frustrations. And I'm advised by my officials that the principal, for example, has been in correspondence for quite some time, a number of years, in fact, with the department. Um, I have offered to meet with the principal of Grey Abbey Primary School um, as soon as I can get clarity on the second tranche, um, because I want to do what we can to um, extend road safety and improve the safety of all of our children, uh, and that includes the pupils going to and from Grey Abbey Primary School on a daily basis. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, I've been writing to the Department on this issue, and I actually met with your officials on several occasions about the 20 mile an hour speed limit, and thank you for that. I'm probably the only member that drives past Grey Abbey Primary School every day, several times a day. Grey Abbey Primary School, I would ask, Minister, if the criteria could be reviewed while Grey Abbey Primary School is on the A20, which is a 30 mile an hour zone at that point. There's actually articulated lorries that pass within two feet of the school wall. Um, it is an extremely dangerous blind corner where children, um, to be honest, run across the road with the lollipop person to avoid being run over by many milk lorries and tankers. I would just ask, Minister, that in the second tranche that you consider that the, the initial tranche Grey Abbey could never have been included in because it's within a 30 mile an hour zone, when in actual fact it is one of the most dangerous schools in Northern Ireland. I thank the member for her question, uh, and I'm happy to give that feedback to my officials in terms of their consideration of the second tranche of funding. Liz Kimmins. Well, good pray, Liz Ken I thank the minister for her answer so far, and I, and I know it will be no surprise that, that I'm asking a question on this one. Minister, as you know, a very small number of schools from New York were included in the first tranche, um, and whilst it is very welcome, um, can I ask the minister that any future rollouts will focus on areas that were not covered, so that schools in my constituency, like Killian Primary School, St Clare's Abbey, St Joseph's High School, um, may be included? And can you also provide detail on how the department decides which schools will be included? Thank you. I thank the member for her question. Um, we had to limit the number of schools in this financial year just passed for the practicalities of delivery, and I was very keen that when we set out my ambition around this, we were able to deliver on it, which is why we thought carefully about the 100 schools. I am very committed to continuing the rollout, and we have a departmental assessment framework. I've shared it with a number of members who have corresponded to me uh, on this matter. I think the fact that we now will have it present at 103 schools means that there will be many more schools that will be considered for that, including within um, your own constituency, and I'm happy to keep you updated. I have no doubt that the member will continue to write to me on this matter as well. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. I welcome uh, that you have installed the 20 mile per hour speed limits at many of our schools, and the protecting children is a priority for you. Um, uh, with your commitment to do more this year, from a financial perspective, uh, can I ask have you received enough money uh, from the Finance Minister to facilitate this? Thank you. I thank the member for her question. And my department has received an incre increase in capital funds um, from the 2020-21 opening capital budget. Um, the resource budget is, as always, for my department, challenging, and this will have an impact as we seek to deliver on the range of capital projects uh, within the department. Uh, as I said, we have had uh, budget allocations across from the Department of Finance. I am now working with my officials on the details of that uh, to make the specific allocations within my own department. Uh, but I want to assure members, I have said since taking a post that um, road safety was a priority for me. Um, I am very much aware uh, of the, the great enthusiasm across the House, but also in communities ensure that we are doing much more in terms of school safety, and that is why I remain committed to this project and committed to the further rollout of the 20 miles per hour across many more schools in this new financial year. Jerry Carroll, Honya Kesh, they call Jerry Carroll. Thank you. Question number two, please. Day-to-day -day staffing issues, such as temporary promotions, are the responsibility of management, not ministers. However, I am aware that temporary promotions are routinely used across the Northern Ireland Civil Service Departments as cover for vacant posts where there is a clear business need and no immediate alternative available. Temporary promotions are, as their name suggests, temporary arrangements which are only intended to be in place until a permanent appointment can be made. At the end of February, my department had 159 temporary promotions in place from a workforce of 2,973 staff. This represents 5% of the workforce and is below the Northern Ireland Civil Service average of 9%. Indeed, my department has the lowest percentage of temporary promotions in place across the Northern Ireland Civil Service. 
The Department for Infrastructure Departmental Board regularly monitors the number of temporary promotions across the department. My officials are also working with the civil service human resources to do what is required to fill all affordable vacancies as quickly as possible. Minister, for uh, her answer, and I think I note the, the figures she gave, but obviously it's still um, too high in many people's opinions. Um, has the minister or her department carried out any uh, research or work in the impact of temporary promotion on staff in her department, including on the retention of workforce, staff, uh, mental health and wellbeing? Because many will think that if they are fit for a temporary promotion, uh, why not a permanent one? Thank you. I thank the member um, for his question. Uh, and as I said, these are matters that are dealt with on management side as opposed to the ministerial side. But of course, as a minister, you know, I very much care for the health and well-being of my department's staff. I'm not aware of any research that has taken place. That doesn't mean that it hasn't. Um, but I'm happy to take the issue away, discuss it with my officials and provide the member with an update. Um, question for hey, Carmel, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Minister, I understand that vacancies have affected delivery of service, including across the road service. At a committee recently, you said you recognise the importance of improving rural roads, and, and a 2019 audit report called for the structure and maintenance budget to be more fairly allocated across the rural road network. So, my question would be: Will the Minister commit to greater coverage? of rural roads network within the structure and maintenance budget and also cover those vacancies to deliver that programme? Gormin Margaret. I thank the member for his question. On the issue of vacancies, at the end of March 21, the Department had 2,991 staff in post and 418 vacancies. It is important to point out that of these vacancies, 86 were industrial posts and 332 were non-industrial, so uh, administrative and part-time grades as well. Um, we are working hard to ensure that we can fulfil affordable vacancies um, as quickly as possible. On the issue of structural maintenance, um, the member will be aware that I had set up a rural roads fund uh, in the previous financial year, had allocated £10 million to that. I recognise the importance of trying to address regional imbalance across the north, but also recognising the state of some of our rural roads um, and the impact that that has on local communities and businesses. As I, uh, although I have yet to finalise uh, my budget for this new financial year, I appreciate the importance of rural roads and a significant improvement of those, so I remain committed to a rural roads fund. Uh, the consideration that I have now is how much money I would be allocating to that, uh, but my intention would be that certainly there wouldn't be any reduction in the rural roads fund in this new financial year. Your Mayor Dolores Kelly for your case. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Uh, Minister, whilst we all recognise that many civil servants have been working very hard throughout the pandemic, nonetheless, in a recent court judgment, there was a damning indictment of civil servants within your uh, department, which I hasten to add predated uh, your tenure as Minister. I just wonder, do you share my concerns on what actions will be taken as a consequence? And I thank the member for her question. The, the Court of Appeal uh, finding that the member refers to relates to a procurement competition run in 2015. Uh, the Court found that there was a manifest error in the Department's approach to the award of multiple term type uh, contracts across Northern Ireland. I am advised that the procurement process for these contracts has been amended significantly since 2015. In 2018, the Road Centre of Procurement Expertise was reaccredited through a rigorous external assessment examination. Uh, but as a member says, this really is a cause of concern, it certainly is a cause of concern for me. And as a minister now in post, I obviously want to understand what happened here, how it happened, and what steps have been taken to ensure that it can never occur again. That's why I met with my permanent secretary uh, after the ruling, and I am now considering the next steps. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. No. I call Andrew Muir.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for her responses thus far. As the Minister is aware, she has got a significantly increased capital budget for this financial year, but the resource budget is largely standstill. Is the Minister confident that she will be able to deliver upon that capital budget and the, the allocations made, as particularly in relation to the human resources within her department? I am conscious of, the, for example, cattle boilings already raised, the roads resurfacing. I have a list of the length of my arm in terms of roads that need tackled in North Down. If you have got the money, will you be able to spend it? I thank the member for his question, and, and he is right to point out uh, that there is uh, the capital budget, and we can do a lot with the capital budget in, in this financial year. But of course, that requires an accompanying resource budget, and the resource budget allocation is a real-time cut when you consider inflation. So. The truth is that it will be challenging, but I want to assure the member that this is very much on my radar. I have been meeting with my permanent secretary and senior officials as well to ensure that we have measures in place so that we can maximise our capacity and deliver on the schemes right across Northern Ireland, given the capital investment that we have at our disposal this financial year. Here, Mayor John O'Dowd for your case. I call John O'Dowd. I will ask and call your case number three. Question number three, please. I thank the member for his question. I know this is an issue that he has raised with me uh, on a number of occasions. Um, and as previously stated, my officials are currently developing a new suite of transport plans and the Regional Strategic Transport Network Transport Plan, referred to as the RSTNTP. Um, and it's in the first in the line for completion. This will set out future investment and improvement for our strategic transport networks by road, rail and bus and reflect my commitment to improving connectivity for the benefit of our economy and communities across the north. Travel by rail is an issue that I feel very passionately about and I am ambitious in terms of what we can do to deliver better rail connectivity. Since coming into office, I have been clear that my priority is addressing regional imbalance, better connecting communities and importantly ensuring that we shape our places around our people, for our people and with our people. So I was delighted to recently announce with the Transport Minister, Eamon Ryan, TD, an all-island strategic rail review. And this review will allow us to consider our rail network across this island to view how we can improve it for everyone. Officials are working together to progress this. And in addition to that, in respect of the, the strategic transport plan, my intention is to publish that for public consultation later this year. I recognise the potential which additional rail halts on our rail network could provide to areas such as Craigavon. Uh, and I would encourage the member, when he is responding to the consultation, to reflect his views so that we consider that as we shape our rail services in particular going forward. Case Darlene Thackeray, John O'Dowd. Thank the Minister. And I have raised it with you several times, just to keep it in your head when it comes to the conclusion of, of the report. But would the Minister agree with me if the only outworkings of the Belfast to Dublin High Speed Rail Link are the Belfast Economic Dublin Corridor, or the most recent report you have published, is that we get people into Belfast quicker or into Dublin quicker, and we miss out on providing economic opportunities to those people along the railway line, then it is a missed opportunity in total. I, I, I share the member's um, analysis on this, and I, I think him and I have, have exchanged before on seeing transport as a key driver of regeneration in communities. Of course, with, when you want to expand rail, there is reality of budgetary constraints uh, as well. But I think that the, the wonderful thing about the All Island Strategic Rail Review is, yes, it's looking at enhancements to the existing rail network, but it's also looking at opportunities to expand and to see uh, rail as the regeneration catalyst um, that it is. So I would be hopeful that bringing all of these strands of work together, that we can see better connectivity when it comes to rail uh, in communities right across the island. Here, Mayor Dolores Kelly, for your case. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I join my upper band colleague in promoting the central area of Craigavon as a suitable location for a rail halt. But, and, and I welcome the Minister's commitment and Transing's commitment to the improvements at Lurgan uh, Railway Station. But, Minister, in terms of integrated travel, there, there's a, there is a lack of uh, integration between the bus and the rail at times. So I just wonder, in terms of the huge manufacturing base that we have within the central area, you know. Uh, in terms of dialogue with your economy minister uh, uh, colleague at the executive, you know what um, um, consultation or what uh, 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 information is shared between ministers to look at uh, bo both uh, the, these areas. I thank the member for her question, and 
uh, the Regional Strategic Transport Network Plan um, that I'll be going out to consult on later this year is about looking at our road, our bus uh, and our rail up to 2035. So that will provide an important opportunity uh, for all of us to feed into that process and to help shape it. Uh, and I am committed to working with all of my executive colleagues um, as we try to deliver on our programme for government commitments. Uh, the member is right to talk about the importance of transport corridors with economic growth, about business links. And, you know, that's why I'm, I'm very pleased that one of the strands of the All Island Strategic Rail Review will be to look at rail connectivity to our international gateway. So that's our ports and our airports as well, uh, because we recognise the important role that transport corridors have to play in terms of growing the economy, but also in terms of tackling the climate emergency. Call Roy Bakes. The, the Minister's answer today has been focused on road, rail and bus. But would the Minister acknowledge that to have a successful integrated transport system, we also need to have effective park and ride schemes uh, and a network of both rock, walking and cycling routes? I absolutely would agree with the member on that, and I, I can see his conversion that's happening with Mr. Beggs, which is great to see. Um, no, in all seriousness, park and rides are really important, which is why, as part of my Blue Green Fund, uh, we are advancing a number of park and rides um, across Northern Ireland. You're absolutely right that it is about improving and strengthening our public transport network, uh, but we have to be encouraging people to take that shift out of their private car onto active travel and to public transport and in order to do that you have to give people choice so we need to make sure that we have safe active travel infrastructure for people we need to make sure that we have an inclusive accessible and attractive public transport network and so i was pleased to be able to meet with the member and others at the cycling apg uh, very recently to share some of the progress uh, in terms of the work that my department is taking in this area and i very much appreciate the support from across the house in trying to progress this agenda can we bring Fra McCann onto the screens, please? My who Fra Kesht for Hunya Fra McCann. Question for Fra McCann. Minister Kesht of Arcug, question five. Since my announcement in October recommending planning approval for the redevelopment of Casement Park, my officials continue to make considerable progress towards issuing the final planning decision. Departmental officials have been working at pace to progress the required planning agreement, which must be in place before the final planning decision can issue. The Departmental Solicitor's Office and the GAA's legal team remain in regular contact in respect of the details of the planning agreement, and both parties are keen to reach agreement as soon as possible. I look forward to the final planning decision issuing for this project, as I am of the view that the project will give a real boost to sport across our island, the local economy, and finally give the GAA its home in Ulster. Go roll my uh, Minister. Uh, the, the, the Minister will be aware of the importance that the Casement Park project has for the West Belfast community and for wider gales uh, in Ulster. Uh, can the Minister give a, an indication as to when we can expect the final plan and decision uh, so this highly anticipate, anticipated investment can be finally proceed? Uh, she knows her. her, her, her uh, how people have been waiting for years and years for this decision uh, and hopefully it can be made shortly but it can only be done when people have an, an, an indication when that can be. I thank the member for his question and I agree with him that this will be uh, an economic driver for the local economy in West Belfast, Greater Belfast as well, I actually think, um, and also will give a real boost to sport um, and all of the benefits that come with that. I want to assure the member that my officials are working at pace to progress this. Uh, it's of course right that we progress it at pace, but we do so uh, properly, and my officials and I are committed to ensuring that all of the statutory processes are correctly completed and that they are correctly correctly completed in the quickest possible time frame. Thank you. I call William Humphrey. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister what meetings has the Minister of Officials had with Moore Residence Group uh, around the Casement Park area, and can she enlighten the House of what the outcome of those meetings was? 
I thank the member um, for his question. Um, my decision to recommend planning approval for the new stadium at Casement Park on the 13th of October followed a comprehensive assessment of the planning application by my planning officials, including extensive consultation with the relevant statutory consultees and the public. As Minister, I took all issues into consideration and all of the different views that were represented. I appreciate that this is not the decision that some local residents wanted, but I have previously explained the reasons why I arrived at the conclusion that I did. In doing that, I haven't had any meetings with residents, but as I say, I have closely examined and very carefully considered the representations of all those who have made representations in respect of this planning application. I call Dr. Steve Aiken. Please. I can confirm to the member that I received a letter from the office of Sammy Wilson MP on the 11th of February of this year, endorsed by the eight DUP members of Parliament. The letter outlined strong support for the delivery of planning approval for the proposal and asked that I make a quick determination on the application. I received further communication from Paul Garvin, MP, on the 1st of April to clarify that this letter did not represent his views on the proposal and that his view is and remains that my department must make a decision on this application to bring this matter to a conclusion. And he asked that the department update its record to ensure that this, this view on the application is properly reflected. Supplementary for Dr. Steve Aiken. And may I thank the Minister for her answer so far, but I'm sure the Minister is as confused as I am by what uh, the MP for South Antrim actually said. But would the Minister confirm that uh, from the representations from the Council, councillors, many elected representatives across the entire region and not just South Antrim, that the opposition to the High Town incinerator that many, including myself, has referred to as RHI2, continues? And we would like to see this uh, incinerator brought, uh, planning, uh, brought to conclusion rapidly so that we can bin this ridiculous project. In respect of, of the, the member's question, you know, this has been uh, uh, an application of huge interest. There are in excess of 5,200 letters of objection associated with the application, with around 160 letters of support. And the member will appreciate that within planning there are proper processes to be followed, uh, and that is what is occurring in this case, as in all cases. As soon as my officials are in a position to be able to make a recommendation to me, uh, I will ensure that they do so. Terry Kelly for a question. Good morning, uh, and uh, it's, it's not often I might agree with uh, Steve Egan, but he has described it exactly as I would have. And uh, I suppose just to ask the Minister, would you agree with me that uh, the assessment, the actual amount of waste which would be necessary in terms of the capacity that's been talked about here, is, doesn't exist? I thank the member for his question. The question of the need for the facility is a matter for the applicant and DERA. Uh, given the passage of time and in light of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, my department has asked DERA for an update on a statement of need in the context of the proposed development and of the strategic and long-term needs for waste management and their circular economy in the north. A response is waited from DERA on this issue. However, the need for the facility is a key material planning matter for my planning officers to consider when making a recommendation to me on the application. Very brief question for Mr. Allister. It's ridiculous to have waited for over seven years for a decision in this planning application. And meanwhile, councils cannot meet properly their statutory obligations, and we are exporting waste around the world to be incinerated and dumped elsewhere. How is that helping clean up our world? I thank the member for his question, and I am keen to bring a resolution to this long-standing application for all involved. But if a sound decision is to be reached, it is important the planning process is completed correctly. The necessary administrative processes are currently being undertaken, including requesting consultation advice from the necessary interested bodies and public authorities. I can assure the member that once all processes have been undertaken, my officials will make a recommendation to me. And that that concludes uh, the period of topical questions, and we now move to 
The, sorry, that concludes the written questions. Uh, we now move to the topical questions. Question number one from Mr Doug Beattie has been withdrawn, so therefore I call Mr William Humphrey. And, uh, thank you, Minister, for answer so far. Recently, Minister, my uh, court councillor colleagues and I met with the Housing Executive in Belfast City Council with regard to Harmony Lane. There are considerable problems there in terms of considerable illegal dumping, pollution of the river, antisocial behaviour, uh, illegal traffic, uh, including lorries across a bridge that isn't regulated or checked, and drug dealing. Considerable criminality happening. Uh, your department has been singularly unhelpful in terms of blocking off this lane. Can I ask the Minister why that is? I thank the member for his question. And he has highlighted a number of difficulties and problems there that would fall across a number of statutory agencies. Uh, my department, DERA, given there's fly tipping, the PSNI, given that there is drug taking the council. Uh, and in fact, the Lord Mayor of Belfast had written to my department on this matter, and my officials are engaging with him. I'm happy to get an update on the latest position and to provide that to the member. Supplementary for Mr. Thank you, thank you very much. Humphrey. I think it's my understanding there has been no responses yet to the Lord Mayor. This morning, my colleague, party colleague, the, the dear Minister Edmund Poots, visited the site with, with my council colleagues and local residents. The Minister has agreed to convene a multi agency roundtable discussion, including the departments the, the Minister mentions and the police. Can the Minister assure this House and me and my constituents living in, in, in the Glenside area that her department will play an active role in that roundtable discussion and multi agency meeting? I can assure the member that my department proactively engages in a range of multi-agency meetings right across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, my officials work and live in their communities. They care deeply for them, and they are considerably proactive in trying to address the problems that are multifaceted that are visited in many of our communities uh, across the north. So, as my department has always done, my department will continue to proactively engage and will certainly participate in the multi-agency meetings that the member has referred to. Can we bring Sinead McLaughlin onto the screens, please? Cash take Sinead McLaughlin. Question for Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As a minister in the executive, can I ask, does the minister share my concerns at the situation unfolding concerning the chief executive of Mid Antrim and East Antrim Council, who authored um, uh, an extremely contentious letter to the UK government under advice and direction from the DUP MPs? Before the minister um, answers, just the minister, of course, will be aware that there is currently an inquiry ongoing through one of the committees, that is the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee at the moment, around matters related to some disclosures on the withdrawal of staff from the, the Port of Larne. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do have um, some very serious concerns about what uh, appears to be happening in this instance. Uh, as the member, or as Mr Deputy Speaker has said, I am also aware that this matter is subject to an inquiry by the Environment and Agricultural Committee, and I have no doubt that members will have real um, concerns with what has emerged in recent days. Uh, what I would say in this instance is that I think one of the key questions that many people have is who is the uh, Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim Council acting on behalf of? Is it the Council members or a consortium of DUP MPs? Thank you, Minister, for your answer. And it's clear that you are as concerned as I am. Does the Minister agree with me that whether it's this issue or the DUP's own minister messing about in other issues, the DUP is the common factor here. Whether they agree or not with the protocol, they have to fulfil their legal duties. I thank the member for her supplementary question. Um, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a legally binding obligation, and all ministers are required to fulfil their legal responsibilities. Uh, certainly, uh, in terms of my own party, we have put forward a proposal that we take a twin-track approach to the issues around the protocol, so we work together to find solutions, pragmatic solutions to the difficulties that have emerged, but also at the same time work to maximise the opportunities that are there for our economy uh, and for our communities, given the uniqueness uh, of the situation that Northern Ireland finds itself in. Of course, I will continue as Minister to fulfil all of my legal obligations in this regard, and I am very much committed to working with all executive colleagues to ensure that we get the best possible outcomes for the people of Northern Ireland. 
Here, Sir Melissa McHugh for your question. I call Melissa McHugh for your uh, first question. Good morning, Carla. Uh, Minister, uh, in relation to unadopted roads, and I'm sure that applies to every single constituent throughout the north of Ireland. Uh, what, in fact, uh, are you doing there to address that issue uh, in relation to unadopted roads? I thank the member for his question. Um, there, my department holds information on roads within private developments that are determined for adoption, and we manage the adoption of the road infrastructure through the private streets determination process. Unadopted private street sites are at various stages of progress, ranging from planning permission recently granted to those that are largely complete. There are currently approximately 67 unadopted streets in the Old Straban Council area, and my officials continue to inspect these sites and engage with developers to encourage them to bring the infrastructure to the required standard for adoption. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer. But in addition, you know, um, because of the impact that they actually have, say, within communities and that as well too, uh, what strategy are you actually adopting there in terms of, say, even enforcement and the likes of it to ensure that these roads are brought up to a standard that will facilitate people even to have something as simple as their bins collected? Thank the member for the question, and, and this is an issue in communities who are experiencing this. As I say, my official works with developers to try to get the completion of developments, uh, but where uh, required, the department will also not shy away from taking enforcement and from taking legal action, given the importance of this issue to communities right across Northern Ireland. Jerry Kelly. Question for Jerry Kelly. Could I ask the Minister to give an update on uh, phase two of the, the Glider um, scheme, which, as you know, uh, involves North Belfast? I thank the member for his question. Uh, and again, this is about uh, providing attractive and inclusive and accessible public transport options for people. Uh, it's important, uh, particularly given the climate emergency. And so the BRT2 scheme is an important element of this. I can advise the member that DFI teams, along with consultants Atkins, are continuing to actively work remotely on the development of this project, which is also a Belfast Region City Deal infrastructure project. A feasibility and options appraisal is currently being developed, and I hope to be in a position to consider its outcome shortly. An interim outline business case for the Belfast Rapid Transit 2 project was forwarded to the Belfast Region City Deal Executive Board on the 12th of August. I thank the Minister for a comprehensive uh, closing down my second question. <laughs> But uh, can I ask her, in terms of uh, uh, the route, is, is there any more detail on, on the, the route option and uh, the indicative timeline, which she touched upon uh, just there and I, but um, to say, you know, this is something which would be very welcome in terms of uh, the addition to the, the, green, the green economy and green recovery following the pandemic? I thank the member um, for his question. Um, in respect of, of the routes, officials are working through options, um, but I want to assure the member that we will be going out to consult on the options uh, for North Belfast and for South Belfast. Uh, and I would encourage businesses in North Belfast and South, uh, residents and elected reps, to be feeding into that consultation process so that we can arise, arrive at the best outcome in terms of the preferred route uh, going forward. Ennis, a question for Sinead Ennis. Gurmiogan, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister for an update on the Narrow Water Bridge project? I thank the member for her question. The Narrow Water Bridge project um, is a project of huge importance in terms of the locality and boosting uh, the local economy, but it also will greatly enhance the tourism offering as well in the region. It is a commitment in new decade, new approach, and I recently met with both councils in the area uh, to hear their views to reaffirm them of my commitment to the project. Work is ongoing uh, around options, um, and I have gave a commitment to go back down to visit both councils again to give them a progress report um, in the summer. 
Um, I think it's very important that we continue to work to advance this project. I think it's particularly pertinent in the context of Brexit as well. And so I remain committed to working with Minister Eamon Ryan, um, but also uh, with the Taoiseach's office, very mindful of the Shared Island Fund, so that we can move this project forward because people have been waiting a very, very long time in seeing this realised. And I thank the Minister for her continued commitment to the bridge and she knows that I never miss an opportunity to raise it with her um, because, as, as she has said, the massive boost it will be in terms of the uh, connectivity around the lock uh, for counties down in Louth, for the economy and, of course, for tourism. Uh, what, can the Minister uh, advise whether, when she goes back to meet with the, uh, the councils, both Louth and Newry Morning Down, will she in, be in a position to present the options that are being discussed between yourself and your counterpart, uh, Minister Ryan, and how soon after those options or a, a final option is settled upon Will, how soon after that does the Minister anticipate that we, we will actually see uh, boots on the ground and ground broken in terms of starting the, the actual construction of Narrow Water Bridge? Thank you. I thank the member for her question and her steadfast commitment for this project. Um, we are due to discuss Narrow Water Bridge at the rescheduled NSMC Transport Sectoral Meeting, which has been rescheduled for early May. And so that will give me an opportunity to discuss this specific project with my ministerial counterpart, Eamon Ryan. Uh, I very much um, have gave a commitment to both councils in the area that when I go down in the summer, I want to be giving a progress um, report. Um, and so hopefully after we have the uh, Transport Sectoral meeting and then when we have the full NSMC meeting in the summer, Mr Deputy Speaker, we'll have a much clearer picture in terms of how we take this project forward. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Um, to ask the Minister of Infrastructure what investigation she has carried out following the breach of security last Friday evening, Saturday morning at Castle Barracks in Eskillen, a section of which is occupied by the DFI, who also control the use of the flagpole. Um, so I thank the member for her question. Um, the member is referring to uh, an incident where um, a tricolour was put up on DFI uh, property at the DBA. Uh, action was taken very quickly by our facilities staff uh, and the flag was taken down. Quick supplementary for Rosemary Barton. Thank yeah. you. Um, this is an area of historical and architectural significance, Nenniskillen. Uh, what added security will you be putting in place to ensure that there is no breach in the future? Thank the member for her supplementary. Um, I'm not aware of an incident like this having taken place before, uh, but certainly I will ask my officials to look into it because it's important that we understand how this happened uh, and if required additional measures will be taken. Uh, but I do want to put on record my appreciation for the swift action of DFI staff uh, in ensuring that uh, things were taken down, it was restored to normality. Uh, members, that concludes question time, and I invite members. Yes, point of order, Mr. Gildon. You. Well, last can call you. Uh, last can call you. Can I ask the speaker to look at uh, the language that was used by Mr. Thomas Buchanan in the chamber earlier in relation to his question to the minister? And I have informed Mr. Buchanan that I will be raising this point of order. During his question, Mr. Buchanan referred to members of this house advocating premeditated murder. I believe, given the sensitivity of this subject, that that language is inaccurate, it is inappropriate, and I believe could and will cause untold harm to people who are struggling with these situations and who are accessing services to which they are legally entitled. Yeah, I appreciate the member for raising that point with us. We are all responsible individually for the use of moderating and sensitive language. Uh, in this chamber, and indeed without it. Uh, but I will reflect on that and I will pass it on for the, to the Speaker for his uh, deliberation. Thank you.